Hi, everyone, and welcome to A Gem of a Secret Podcast. My name is Donatella, my secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. How are you doing tonight, Coco? Um, I'm actually doing really great because Trump is no longer in office. Yes. And, Goodbye. And that is... Seriously, I know that absence makes the heart grow fonder, but I feel like that might not be the case in this case. <laughs> so yesterday was his last day in office, and it was um, there was someone that said, today is the last day that we will have never had a female vice president. Oh, I loved that quote. I yeah. loved that. Yeah. And Seriously. I think, you know, I think that's great. And it's, you know, more so than that, we feel that there is a lot of work to do moving ahead, but there is a sense of optimism with it because of the way that everything has gone down. Absolutely. Yeah. And I just really recognize too that there, I know that there's a lot of work to do, yeah. but like as a black non-cis queer person in our community, I do feel like I can breathe a little bit easier. I do feel like, there's a future insight. I was so terrified, and I do mean terrified, that Trump would do something yeah. to make this, or his support. I I can say it now, because obviously, um, you know, it's the next day. I was fully, express, fully expecting uh, President Biden to be assassinated um, on, on Inauguration Day. I fully yeah. expected it. Yeah. Um, and I, I was holding, I did actually feel like I was holding my breath again, but for a different reason that this, like, finally my freedom was going to be taken away from me so successfully yeah. by some person who just couldn't accept the fact that Trump was no longer president. Yeah. That there would be like martial law declared or something and there would be uprisings and yeah, no, it's scary because we were in a very different place just a, a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago with mm -hmm. what happened on the Capitol. And of course, we just did our episode about that. I think I think it's interesting. I saw one of the news headlines I read this morning said, as Trump leaves office, coming off the heels of five people dying in Capitol riots that he helped ensue. And I was <laughs> like, dang. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's the I, truth. It is the truth. And like, it's horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It really is that that happened. I don't even like, it's not even like some people were talking about his presidential pardons and like, that's a very um, traditional thing. Mm -hmm. Presidents will pardon a bunch of people. He did not pardon himself, um, from what I understand. Yeah. Because um, I know that he's obviously being looked at to be impeached and, you know, going to the Senate to see what happens there. Well, it's because also, yeah, it's he didn't want to admit guilt. Right. Yeah. Right. Because then that would basically make it to where the Senate would have to find him guilty. Oh, no. He did wrongdoing. Yeah. yeah. It's... Toxic as I'll get out. But mm -hmm. before we jump further into this, because as you obviously figured out, listeners, this is a, this is our Inauguration Day episode. Mm -hmm. um, I need to ask Donna, what are you um, wearing this evening? Oh, well, you see, I have on this um, very, very lovely patriotic number. I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> It's just very patriotic and uh, flashy. <laughs> I can see the flash. I put a lot of thought into it, as you can obviously tell. So much thought into it. Yeah. Um, There's like reds and whites and blues in it and such. <laughs> so patriotic. <laughs> this, this outfit. She I, is I, look, Lord. I look like, a, like one of those uh, bomb pops. Bomb Pops. Yeah. God, I can't wait for the animation that somebody's going to make off of this episode where it's just... <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I'm just dressed as a giant Bomb Pop, actually. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's Great. where we got yeah. to with all that. Red, white, and blue Bomb Pop. As you can tell, I didn't really have this outfit planned. <laughs> <laughs> I panicked. <laughs> so I... Coco Jam Holiday and wearing um, so obviously I saw Michelle Obama's beautiful um, fuchsia slash purple uh, pantsuit oh, and that was Kamala Hor uh, Harris wore a beautiful purple outfit as well yes she did as well um but I'm mimicking Michelle Obama's. Oh, okay. I, hers was beautiful. Okay. Wow. Um, and I just, I just loved, I loved the so uh, President Obama, uh, President Obama had a. Uh, 
a coat on, like his, like a pea coat, like a long pea coat mm-hmm. on. And she was walking with her pea coat open with like matching colors for the underdress. Um, and I just love a drag queen in pants. And Michelle Obama is practically a drag queen. So like, <laughs> I just, like, I was like, dang, she, she looks is a queen. real good. She is a queen for sure. I didn't get to see what she was wearing. I only got to kind of like see the upper half of the outfit. Mm-hmm. Um, So I didn't, I didn't even know that she was wearing a purple outfit, but I really liked Kamala's outfit too. Yeah, I, yeah. I liked her outfit. It was beautiful. And I yeah. have to say, I have to say that I super love all the memes that came out about Bernie Sanders, who did not dress up, who was <laughs> no. just like sitting there like, I don't give two Fs about what's happening in front of me. So what was it the first part of the inauguration that you flipped into, like when you turned it on? Because like I started it and the very first shot that I got as I started it when I flipped to the live footage was a very big scowling close up of Mike Pence's face. Oh, um, mine, I, I joined a little late. And so mm-hmm. I was actually right at the start of Biden's speech. Oh, is when I you missed the scowling in. Mike Pence. I did miss the scowling Mike Pence. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm really disappointed in that. I'm happy that he attended, though. Yeah. Like, that's, that shows a lot about dignity and honor for um, the GOP. Yeah. And, yeah, no, he's a terrible person. Can rot in hell. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but certain traditions I feel like should be upheld. Like we said before in the earlier part of the episode how Trump did never said Biden's name um, in his two or three farewell speeches. Yeah. Um, he did say in one of Trump's farewell speeches uh, when he was talking about all his accomplishments, he called it the China virus. Yeah. And I was so overwhelmed by that in a really bad way. He's been doing it this entire time. And when have you like have you not seen his Twitter? I I have, but I also his Twitter was really like his Twitter was always antagonistic. Him and his supporters refused to call it anything but. Yeah, like, I, mean, I think that's so disgusting because in other official speeches he called it the coronavirus mm-hmm. or COVID-19 like he said that in official speeches. So this was an official speech and he chose the, and he stuttered on it, too. That's what the other part was awkward. He stuttered on it to call it the China virus. Yeah. Because I bet, because the teleprompter probably said coronavirus, but he stopped himself to be problematic and, and say, racist. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Of course he did. I was like, yeah, let's go out on racism. That's... He apparently did leave Biden a letter. He did. And I want to know what it says. So I really do, bad. too. Please, Biden, release it. Let the public know. It probably says he eat, dick, and a, die, He basically. said it was a very <laughs> generous letter. Did Bi- that's what Biden said? Yeah, he it was... said it was a generous letter. I didn't know Trump was capable of generosity, I... much like I didn't know he was ever capable of empathy either. You no, know? I... <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I really didn't. But what generous, like, the, uh, like I feel like that's a fruit basket. Like, what it, what generosity is it the nuclear codes in this letter? Like, what are you talking about here? I don't know. I mean, he needs to release that letter. Us, the, us, the American people, and especially these two drag queens are going to feel a way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we want to know. The American people have a right. The American, <laughs> oh, my God. You just became every older person. <laughs> Go home, Boober. Um, right? I know. I sound like I sound like one of those far right conspiracy people that I like take their content off of the internet. Just kidding. I don't do that. What what, what are you talking? What? Huh? No, I signed an NDA. Talking. I can't talk about this. What? Shush. <laughs> what? Shush. <laughs> Let's talk about something real queer for a second and talk about Lady Gaga's national anthem dress. Cause it was gorgeous. Gorgeous. I loved how um, it was like a ball gown, but the ball gown started like a little bit below her belly button and mm-hmm. below her like ass, yeah. actually, yeah. Um, for this like red thing that she wore. And then she had black, um, like a black ribbon in her hair, mm-hmm. which obviously symbolizes something specifically. Yeah. Um, and I think it's supposed to symbolize the people who died of corona, but I'm not sure. Don't quote me. It it might, it, yeah. But I think that's probably what it was. But she looked beautiful. Her makeup was beautiful. She had a um, gold microphone, mm-hmm. which I thought was just iconic because not every singer had the same microphone. Yeah. And uh, it was be- – actually, I think this was better than her Super Bowl performance. Yeah. Su- sorry, her Super Bowl national anthem. Yeah. Like, I felt like she just – it was so patriotic. It was important to have that like power and that spirit here it, today. It really was. Even like, with um it. I really liked Garth Brooks's Sorry, Amazing um, Grace. Yeah, his yeah. daddy. Yeah, he's daddy. <laughs> Oh he my kind gosh! Of is, like, though. I really like. I mean, Zac Efron obviously got zaddy, but 
Jeez. Garth Brooks came out there with his gut falling over that belt buckle. And I was just like, <laughs> I was like, Zaddy. <laughs> when he took off his hat, I was like, oh, crush me between your thighs. I really, um, yeah, yeah. I really liked the poet Amanda Gorman, too. I think we need to take some time to talk about her. Yeah, Amanda Gorman. So um, <laughs> so when, so this this killed me. She walked, so she gets up in her yellow pea coat or yellow mm-hmm. jacket or whatever it was. With her little red thing in her hair, yeah, with the braids, of course, with the little gold bangles, which I forgot what those are called. Mm-hmm. Um, and she walks up and she waits patiently, obviously, for the person to put up the stool so she can get up on the thing. Even the way she waited was just so graceful. Mm-hmm. And then she takes a few steps forward, gets onto the pedestal, and she is the first ever national, uh, like poet, uh, thing mm-hmm. for the president. And she begins this iconic poem that just transcended party lines and Mm -hmm. touched the heart of Americans in such an iconic way. So Called The Hill We Climb. Yes, called The Hill We Climb. Yeah, I have a favorite line that I want to read from it. And it was like right at the beginning and it struck me so fiercely. Just like she... it. I was so pulled in right at the beginning of it because her words, she just has like a really amazing way with like what we've experienced in these last four years and Mm -hmm. um, a sense of hope for what we have to come. So Mm -hmm. I really liked, I think my favorite line was we've braved the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. The alliteration is just insane. So good. Just so good. I just, I love that. And my favorite line, mm-hmm. just it seems like it's backwards, but it's not. And I really want people to hear this. The line that I loved was, it's because being an American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. Yeah. Like, because, like, a lot of the stuff that uh, she talked about in the poem is about, like, the future and coming together and, like, bridging the gap and building bridges and mm-hmm. um, stuff like that. And then this line here, that's why it struck, it's stuck out to me so much because it's talking about, but we do have problems. Mm-hmm. And to be a better American, to look forward, we have to be able to look at our past and do right by it. So, like, and even, call out the problems. And call out the problems. So, like, like, obviously classic case of systemic racism or homophobia, transphobia, and things like that, like things that are rooted and ingrained into our history, um, like repairing those things will mm-hmm. make a better tomorrow. And like, so even that small line when I saw, I like, I started weeping. Yeah. Like I said weeping, like I started weeping. Like I'm in yeah. a, like a Jane Austen novel. Um, <laughs> I got teary eyed during her poem yeah. and I also even got tired, uh, Tired. <laughs> I got teary-eyed during Garth Brooks's <laughs> Amazing Grace. Yeah, I know. I was just dealing with the heart on the whole time. Um, <laughs> no, I got I got teary-eyed. It, it, it was good. It was. It, it was good. And I just, his twang was really good. I mm-hmm. I was so floored by it. And even the way that like Lady Gaga was looking back at, at the American flag mm-hmm. um, to like sing to the flag, like, it just... It was so iconic. Like, everything about this was really iconic. Mm -hmm. Um, From Bernie Sanders, obviously, wearing his really cheaply made outfit to... Well, actually, let's... Actually, no, we'll save it for... I'll talk about Biden's speech after the break. But Mm -hmm. um, I I I think that from the highlights that I loved about it, Mm -hmm. um, I... The one thing I really appreciate was seeing the unity, seeing Amy Klobuchar there, Mm, seeing mm -hmm. Pete Buttigieg and (laughs) like just like seeing all of them standing in kind of this unity to like try to symbolize that the Democratic Party isn't that broken, like because they were all running mates. Right. Mm -hmm. They had to trash each other and get past each other and then they were able to do that. Yeah. Um, to stand on the stage together and like talk about unity and crossing party lines. Yeah. Um, but before we continue on, I need to ask Donna, how are you doing this evening? Oh, I will let you know after this brief commercial break. Do you wear t-shirts? Do you wear a face mask? I sure as hell hope so. Do you put on your silly little t-shirt and your silly little face mask and wish you had something a little more out there? Yes. Even something, dare I say, 
matching? Girl, yes, duh. Then it looks like HunterDrips.com is exactly what you need. At HunterDrips.com, socially relevant merch and apparel is up for sale. That's never for profit. 50 to 100% of every purchase is donated. I hear they carry matching shirts and masks with designs that say cute little slogans like defund the police, Black Lives Matter, and it goes over your nose and even shirts and hats with your own pronouns on them. You know, things that are important. Oh, so you mean important. And almost all of it is donated? Yes, donated, and guess what? What, it's size inclusive too? Yes, up to 5XL. Why just make clothes for skinny people? It's all made by Queer Artist Girl. The creator of HunterDrips.com is trans, fat, lesbian, and the site also includes merch from other queer artists, including gay Portland rapper Tono. Listeners, head on over to HunterDrips.com and use the code SECRET for 15% off your purchase today. That's SECRET for 15% off your purchase at HunterDrips.com. It's a podcast it with Coco and Donna Tell a podcast Check it out. Tune into what they tell you podcast Check it out. With Coco and Donna Tell a podcast Check it out. Well, Coco, I am feeling incredibly hopeful this inauguration day as we're talking about it here in this episode. I think it's so important that we recognize there's definitely, like I said in the beginning half of this episode, a lot of work to be done. But I think today was like just a good peak of the unity that we're trying to build now with this new administration that's coming in. Absolutely. I, I and I know that like once again that people, especially in Portland, have been criticizing folks for being happy that Trump is out of, sorry, they're criticizing Biden. They're criticizing people being happy about Biden. When in reality what people are happy about is that they can finally breathe from the fact that we don't have a Trump presidency yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um and that's kind of what it's about. So um Well there's let's talk a little bit there's 10 executive orders that Biden is signing here in his first day already um, as as a president. And uh, some of them are dealing with uh, things like DACA. Things Some of them are dealing with things uh, to do with the pandemic. Some of them are to do with the Paris Accord, rejoining that. Um, right, right. And, and undoing a lot of the damages of the Trump administration. Uh, there was also the 1776 commission that's being undone, which was to basically only teach that America's only ever been the greatest country in schools and mm. that there's like not to have like negative history taught about America. So that was something that Trump put in uh, with Betsy DeVos. Oh, DeVos. yeah, I do remember that. So uh, that's been undone. Which oh, is great. thank goodness. Yeah. Like, That's Lord propaganda. It's, it is. Like, let's warp our children's mind to think that they didn't ever do anything wrong. And we we were already grown up in a school system that was warped enough trying to it teach was that, warped that, enough. that the genocide was somehow justified that it was experienced on, on this land. I didn't even learn about Japanese internment camps until high school. Right? Like, yeah. that is so uncomfortable for me. Yeah. I, I don't even know how they could just skip. Like, we even knew about um, uh, the diary of Anne Frank. Like, mm-hmm. most elementary school kids know about that story. And in middle yeah. school, you might even explore it. They don't ever talk about Japanese. Oh, they'll teach camps. you all about the Germans and the Nazis. Oh, all about them. Every, everyone is thoroughly taught about that here in the American education system. Mm-hmm. But we're not taught as much about the wrongs and we're not taught about why things were done truthfully you know it's there's always justifications for why certain things were done in a lot of the a lot of the history books or even when it's taught in these Mm -hmm. history classes Mm -hmm. so i think it's important for us to really like recognize the truth about our history and it's even just in that poem that you were saying you know that we have to like write our past that's something that we have to do. So I I'm, I think that that's an extremely important thing. But the, yeah, just a, a slew of things that he did here on his first day, which I think that's, you know, it's a great step forward. That's admirable. I yeah. mean, let's hold him accountable for the stuff that we wanted Please. to. Um, but also at the same time, there are some things that need to be, that need to happen immediately. Yes. Like kids in cages, uh, which are truly modern day. I love how they don't want to talk about that as being modern day internment camps. Yeah. Like, even Japanese internment camps, they had the ability to shower. And, of course, there was the medical testing that was abysmal and horrible, of course, that happened as well. But, like, there were shelters and they were provided for to a very base degree. Yeah. And that's technically what's happening with 
kids in cages. Mm-hmm. Like, they just don't, like, people are mass hoarded into these places. And yeah, they might be provided food and water and the ability to use the restroom. But like, where's the... Where is the great schooling? Where would be the advancement? Where is the opportunity for these people to become successful members of society? Yeah. Stuff like that. You know, just, I, it's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. In Biden's speech, I do want to, like, talk about something that did really strike me that I think he really characterized the time we're in well in his speech by saying we press forward with speed and urgency for we have much to do in this winter of peril and possibility which i think is the perfect description of what we're in and he goes on to say much to repair much to restore much to heal much to build and much to gain and we really are kind of in this dark winter you know we're in a spot where this pandemic we have 400,000 people now who are dead due to the coronavirus pandemic in the united states Yes, and I know, um, before any of our listeners try to crucify us, I know that some people are marked, you know, um, like being dead by coronavirus if they died from somewhat similar issues, but coronavirus amplified, like, the reason Mm -hmm. that they may have died. Like, I get that. I get that. But there are 400,000 Americans who've lost their lives because of COVID or COVID-related symptoms. Yeah. That is a very large number. It is. Um, Actually, I can actually put it into relation for you. So Grand Junction, Colorado, roughly has about 70,000 people. Yeah. So the entire city of Grand Junction would be wiped out. Yeah. The um, Mesa County um, includes 129,000 people. So Mesa County almost four times. Yes, yeah. it would be wiped out. Yeah. So I that's just I want people to really understand what that number really looks like. Like that's a lot of people. And as the speech said, those four hundred thousand fellow Americans, moms, dads, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, friends, neighbors, and coworkers, we will honor them by becoming the people and nation we know that we can and should be. Yeah. Which that was really powerful to me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember when he said the number because I know it's like it's it's actually like three hundred and ninety something, whatever. But um, it's it more it might be four hundred thousand actually. But um, at this point, but I I think it was so needed. We're gonna get to four hundred thousand, you know. Oh yeah. And that's the sad thing is that there is so much damage just from how it was handled that, you know, we need to rapidly increase our the number of vaccines that we're getting out there. Also, we need to be following these masks. He also, in his executive order, put out a mask mandate um, for federal property. So it is required that you wear a mask on federal property. And I think that it's something that we need to, you know, just keep following. We need to be smart about this. There's no more time for talking about how this was a pandemic because I swear to you, if we do not treat this seriously, because we should have been treating it seriously so long ago, this will be at your door and you will be personally affected by this if we don't really do some things to um to stop stop the spread and and uh and get get people healed one of the um things that i really want to touch on too at the end of biden's speech because it's really powerful for me as a black person to have the president actually even say the words racism and he used it twice in his inauguration speech um he said folks this is a time of testing We face an attack on our democracy and on truth, a raging virus, growing inequality, the sting of systemic racism, a climate crisis, America's role in the world. Um, I just think that that even with the words that he chose, a sting, uh, the sting of systemic racism, Mm -hmm. because I feel like that that is even that doesn't diminish it for me. If people feel problematic, like like that line is problematic, I actually feel like that amplifies it perfectly, because the thing about systemic racism is sometimes it's a low hum and sometimes it's a sting mm. when you're finding, like for instance, the coronavirus has actually affected black and brown people at once again a higher disproportionate rate to their mm-hmm. white counterparts, and black girls are dying because of it, because people don't hear them scream and when you hear that 
that's a sting mm. of systemic racism versus a low hum. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. and I just, it, that part for me was powerful. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Definitely. I think that it was extremely important for him to, to touch on, on everything that happened over the summer with the protests. Yeah. There's just so much healing that needs that to be done. That has to be done. And yeah. I feel like we finally can a little bit. I, I know that I know that there's a lot of work to be done, not just because of, you know, their track records of our new president and vice president. There's a lot of work to be done in dismantling the damage that's been done mm -hmm. over four years. When I talk about healing, it's not about healing the nation specifically as much as it's that needs to happen, of course. Yeah. But healing the last four years of people oh. feeling traumatized and triggered and beaten down from a government that didn't give two shits about any marginalized group like mm -hmm. any group not just between the houseless and or those incarcerated or those with um um those with different ability differently abled people mm -hmm. like it was everyone who wasn't in the majority yeah yeah. And that sucks. Yeah. Yeah, it does. What are some things that we want to see in the first hundred days of this presidency? I want all of the hundred days to be focused on the vaccine. Same. And making sure people are not dying. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, yes, um, Obviously, we need to focus on uh, like climate change, of course. Like mm -hmm. as Bill Nye says, the world is on fire, and we really do need to solve that. We do, but we have a virus that's wiping us out. Yeah, like every effort should be put forth to ending the coronavirus in the United States. Yeah, in my opinion, because there was, as we said, I think on a different episode about the UK like super coronavirus, and then it hit yeah. Colorado, and so now there's super coronavirus and. It's a mutation. Yeah. It's a mutated strain. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that all of our efforts need to go towards that. Mm -hmm. This is something that for the last year has rocked our worlds and mm -hmm. completely changed the way that we live. Mm -hmm. And I was even, I was talking to someone today about it and I was like, it's so crazy how masks are just this new normal in our world now you know it's it's something that when we were kids we saw people in you know other countries using them for like the SARS virus but we never really saw that in America unless you were in a doctor's office right and now it's everywhere you go and it it makes me wonder about you know like if someone from the past were to like end up in this time and all of a sudden see this happening you know like how shocked would they be and like what would they be thinking is happening and it's just such a different world from the world that we lived in just a year ago. Yeah, it's almost been exactly a year, right, since the first case was detected yes. Yes. in the U.S. So, I mean, it's it's strange. It It is. And what really makes me sad about all of it is just understanding and recognizing that no matter what we do, that the world is going to forever be changed. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to actually talk about is I haven't been sick in about a year. Yeah. Because germs are usually picked up from not washing your hands or being in close proximity to other people. Yeah. I haven't had a cold in a very long time. I haven't had a cold. <laughs> I've had allergies and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. I haven't, yeah, I haven't had a cold in a very long time either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of cool. I yeah. mean, to a degree. But um, one thing that I've been thinking about, too, is it's going to change my habits forever. Um, like, I'm going to probably always wash my hands a little bit more. Yeah. Of course, I won't be wearing a mask always because, like, masks have impeded my life. I wear them because you should wear them. Yeah. But I, like, especially being a drag artist... I that mask messes up my makeup like there ain't no tomorrow. Hand sanitizer has become more of a necessity than it was like a luxury item. Oh, absolutely. You know, and that's something I, uh, you know, anytime that we're like 
going on a hike or something, I have hand sanitizer with me or oh, I, absolutely. yeah. So it's, you know, it's definitely, it's definitely just changed the way that we function. And, right. uh, yeah, and that's cr- it's really weird sitting here reflecting on all this because the reason why the podcast that we're on today really started, why we started, you know, taking more effort into what we were doing and, and, uh, working on the podcast more is because we kind of were at home and didn't have as much to do. You know, we were kind of busy with shows and, uh, when we wanted to originally start this and we had the idea we were kind of bogged down with constantly being out there and trying to introduce ourselves into the drag scene here right. and getting the time to be able to sit down and talk about these things have been incredibly important for me Yes, because I am able to process what is happening as it's happening because this year, I mean, for everyone has been filled with so many surprises I don't know it's just been one of the most volatile and unexpected I think that we've had in a while um and and expected things that are unexpected and expected you know it's just been volatile it's it's yeah and even this year uh January um January of 2021 yeah I feel like so many changes have even happened in my own life right now yeah so I'm interested to see what will happen next. I am too. I I really am. I think we have better things to look forward to, but I think it's exactly as how Biden described it. It's a dark winter of sorts. It's like we're waiting to come out of this and yeah, and hopefully see successful. Yeah, because yeah. I don't. The thing is, I don't want to be in June having lost somebody that means the world to me because of no Corona. I, it's actually um, I have. Cases There's, are only raising, they you are know. Going up. There's a term for this, and I, I heard about it in a, and it was in Grey's Anatomy, of course. I have been suffering from, and I know there's a term for this. I've been having anxiety about fearing that I'm going to lose somebody important to me. Um, I, I know there's a term for it. I do, but I just can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah. I, like every time my friends leave or like uh, Donna went to the coast today mm-hmm. or me and my husband drove separately to like my second job today and um, and we drove home separately, obviously, in different cars. And like those moments about how my friends are feeling and how my family's feeling. And my mom texted me lyrics to a song and I immediately freaked out. Like I'm constantly worried that I'm going to lose these people because of, well, maybe the virus. Sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, I was super worried today. I didn't want somebody to like there to be like shooting up cities and towns or looking at black folks on the street and shooting them up. Or I lose my family members just because of inauguration day. Like I am suffering from a lot of, anxiety of things that I can't change and are like kind of improbable to happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's just because of what I feel like we've been put through because of a Trump presidency. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we've talked about it before and we've made references to what I've said about it before, but I think that we just have like, we've been gaslit. We've been lied to. We've been manipulated. We've, I mean, and, and, you know, I don't want to say the complete collective because a lot of people saw past the bullshit right as soon as he was oh, elected or even before then. But it was a relief today to have a speech that didn't focus on American carnage for their inauguration. That right, was what right. Trump referenced. You know, his his speech was very angry. It was about, uh, you know, taking back the country. and And he literally said American carnage. And today we get a message of working together despite our differences and moving forward and coming together and doing what we can to try and resolve all of these crises that have happened in in the last four years. Right. And so not to leave it on a bleak note, I, I really am looking forward to what's happening anxiety aside yeah i i believe in the message that was sent and hopefully our president and our vice president work hard for the american people to truly bridge the gap 
with uniting the American people and understanding that there's a lot of work to do and that they're hopefully up for the task. Yeah. Yeah. We shall see. We shall see. You know. <sighs> I think that brings us to the end of the episode. I think so, too. I think so, too. This was, yeah, I honestly, I was expecting something different from Inauguration Day. I was expecting uh, a little bit more of like a, a violent like night. I was carnage. Expect- yeah, I was, I was expecting e- carnage. I was expecting carnage, you know. I, I was expecting people to be super angry just based off of what's happened in the past two weeks. But we are ending tonight, uh, I mean, fingers crossed, with no riots uh, as we sit down and record this. And uh, this episode will be released the day after Inauguration Day. So with that, listeners, I hope you have a safe and pleasant evening. Yeah. And we'll see you next week. We will. Bye-bye. Bye. This has been another episode of A Gem of a Secret Podcast. The hosts of A Gem of a Secret Podcast are Donatella My Secrets and Coco Jim Holiday. You may follow Donatella My Secrets at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. You may follow Coco Jim Holiday at Coco Jim Holiday on Instagram. Original music by Touche Douche and Party Favors. You can follow them respectively at the Touche Douche and at Party Favors Music on Instagram. For more exclusive content, visit www.ajemofasecretpodcast.com. That is a j e m of a secret podcast. Dot com. Be sure to tune in every week on Thursday for a new episode wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any comments or questions, email us at a gem of a secret pod at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Until next time, goodbye.